Uh, welcome to lesson seven, the last lesson of part one. Um, this will be a pretty intense lesson. Um, and so don't let that bother you because partly what I want to do is to kind of give you enough things to think about to keep you busy until part two. Um, and so, in fact, some of the things we cover today, I'm not going to tell you about some of the details. I'll just point out a few things where I'll say like, okay, that we're not talking about yet, that not, we're not talking about yet. And so then come back in part two to get the details on some of these extra, extra pieces, right? So, we'll, you know, today will be a lot of material pretty quickly it might require a few viewings to fully understand it all, a few experiments and so forth. And that's kind of intentional. I'm trying to give you stuff to, to keep you amused for a couple of months. I um, uh, wanted to start by uh, showing some uh, cool work done by a couple of students, Reshma and NPADA01, who have developed an Android and an iOS app. Um, and so check out uh, Reshma's um, post on the forum about that because they have a demonstration of how to create a, uh, both Android and iOS apps that are actually on the Play Store and on the Apple App Store. Um, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, first, first ones I know of that are on the app stores that are using fast AI. Um, and let me also say a huge thank you to Reshma for all of the work she does both for the fast AI community and the machine learning community more generally and also the women in machine learning community in particular. Uh, she does a lot of fantastic work uh, including providing lots of fantastic um, documentation and tutorials and community organizing and so many other things. So thank you Reshma and congrats on getting this app out there. Um, <coughs> We have lots of Lesson 7 notebooks today, as you see, and we're going to start with the one. So the first notebook we're going to look at is uh, Lesson 7 ResNet MNIST. And what I want to do is uh, look at some of the stuff we started talking about last week around convolutions and convolutional neural networks and start building on top of them to create a fairly modern deep learning architecture largely from scratch. When I say from scratch, I'm not going to re-implement things we already know how to implement, but kind of use the pre-existing PyTorch bits of those. Um, so we're going to um, use the MNIST data set, which, uh, so urls.mnist has the whole MNIST data set. Often we've done stuff with a subset of it. Uh, so in there, there's a training folder and a testing folder. Um, uh, and as I read this in, I'm going to show some more details about pieces of the DataBlocks API so that you see how to kind of see what's going on. Normally with the DataBlocks API, we've kind of said blah, dot, blah, dot, blah, dot, blah, and done it all in one cell, but let's do them one cell at a time. So first thing you say is what kind of item list do you have? So in this case, it's an item list of images. And then uh, where are you getting the list of file names from? In this case, by looking in a folder recursively and that's where it's coming from. Um, you can pass in arguments that end up going to pillow, because pillow or PAL is the thing that actually opens that for us, and in this case, these are black and white rather than um, RGB, so you have to use pillow's convert mode equals L. For more details, refer to the um, Python imaging library documentation um, to see what their convert modes are. But uh, this one is gonna be uh, grayscale, which is what MNIST is. So inside an item list is an items attribute, and the items attribute is kind of the thing that you gave it. It's the thing that it's going to use to create your item. So in this case, the thing you gave it really is a list of file names. That's what it got from the folder. Um, okay, um, when you show images, normally it shows them in RGB, um, and so in this case, we want to use a binary color map. So in FastAI, you can set a default color map for more information about CMAP and color maps, refer to the matplotlib documentation. And so this will set the default color map for fast AI. Okay, so our image item list contains 70,000 items and it's a bunch of images that are one by 28 by 28. Remember that PyTorch puts channel first, so they're one channel, 28 by 28. You might think, well, why aren't they just 28 by 28 matrices rather than a one by 28 by 28 rank three tensor? It's just easier that way. All the 
conv2d stuff and so forth works on rank three tensors. So you want to you want to include that uh, unit axis at the start. And so fastai will do that for you, even when it's reading one channel images. So um, the dot items attribute contains the thing that's kind of read to build the image, which in this case is the, is the file name. But if you just index into an item list directly, you'll get the actual image object. Okay, and so the actual image object has a show method, and so there's, there's the image. So once you've got an image item list, you then split it into training versus validation. Um, you nearly always want validation. If you don't, you can actually use the dot no split method to create a kind of empty validation set. You can't skip it entirely. You have to say how to split, and one of the options is no split, right? And so remember, that's always the order. First, create your item list, then decide how to split. In this case, we're going to do it based on folders. In this case, um, the, the, the validation folder for MNIST is called testing. Um, so in kind of fast AI parlance, we use the same kind of parlance that Kaggle does, which is the training set is what you train on. The validation set has labels, and you do it for testing that your model's working. The test set doesn't have labels and you use it for doing inference or submitting to a competition or sending it off to somebody who's held out those labels for, you know, vendor testing or whatever, okay? So just because a folder in your data set is called testing doesn't mean it's a test set, right? This one has labels, so it's a validation set. Um, okay, so if you want to do inference on lots, you know, lots of things at a time rather than one thing at a time, you want to use the uh, test equals in, in fast AI to say this is stuff which has no labels and I'm just using for inference. Okay, so um, my, my split data is uh, a training set and a validation set, as you can see. Uh, so inside the training set, there's a, par, uh, a folder for each um, image, uh, for each class. Um, so now we can take that um, split data and say label from folder. So first you create the item list, then you split it, then you label it. And so you can see now we have an X and a Y, and the Y are category objects. A uh, category object is just a, a class, basically. Um, so if you index into a label list, such as ll.train as a label list, you will get back <coughs> an independent variable, independent variable, X and Y. So in this case, the X will be an image object, which I can show. Uh, and the Y will be a category object which I can print. That's the number, it's the number eight category, and there's the eight. Um, next thing we can do is to add transforms. In this case, we're not going to use the normal get transforms um, function because we're doing digit recognition, and digit recognition, like you wouldn't want to flip it left, right, that would change the meaning of it. You wouldn't want to rotate it too much, that would change the meaning of it. Also, because these images are so small, kind of doing zooms and stuff is going to make them so fuzzy as to be unreadable. So normally for small um, images of uh, digits like this, you just add a bit of random padding. So I'll use the random padding function, which actually returns two transforms, the bit that does the padding and the bit that does the random crop. So you have to use star to say put both these transforms in this list. Uh, so now we can call transform. This empty array here is referring to the validation set transforms. So no transforms for the validation set. Um, now we've uh, got a transformed labeled list. We can pick a batch size and choose data bunch. We can choose normalize. Um, in this case, we're not using a pre-trained model. So there's no reason to use image net stats here. Um, and so if you call normalize like this without passing in uh, stats, it will grab a batch of data at random and use that to decide what normalization stats to use. And that's a good idea if you're not using a pre-trained model. Okay, so we've got a data bunch. And so in that data bunch is a data set, which we've seen already. Um, but what is interesting is that the training data set now has data augmentation because we've got transforms. So plot multi is a fast AI function that will plot the result of calling some function for each of this row by column grid. Uh, so in this case, my function is just grab, and, grab the first image from the training set 
And because each time you grab something from the training set, it's going to load it from disk, and it's going to transform it on the fly. Right? So people sometimes ask, like, how many transformed versions of the image do you create? And the answer is kind of infinite. Each time we grab one thing from the data set, we do a random transform on the fly. Okay, so potentially you, every one will look a little bit different. Uh, so you can see here, if we plot the result of that lots of times, we get eights in slightly different positions because we did random padding. Um, you can always grab a batch of data then from the um, data bunch, because remember a data bunch has data loaders, and data loaders are, are things that you grab a batch at a time. And so you can then grab an X batch and a Y batch, look at their shape, batch size by channel, by row, by column. Um, all fast AA data bunches have a show batch, which will show you what's in it in some sensible way. Okay, so that's a quick walkthrough of the data block API stuff to grab our data. So let's start out uh, creating a simple CNN, a simple component. So the input is um, 28 by 28. So <clears throat> let's define, I like to define when I'm creating architectures a function which kind of does the things that I do again and again and again. I don't want to call it with the same arguments because I'll forget, I'll make a mistake. So in this case, all of my convolutions are going to be kernel size 3, stride 2, padding 1. So let's just create a simple function to do a conv with those parameters. So each time I have a convolution, it's skipping over one pixel, so it's doing jumping, jumping two steps each time. Uh, so that means that each time we have a convolution, it's going to halve the grid size. So I've put a comment here showing what the new grid size is after each one. So after the first convolution, we have one channel coming in, because it's, remember, it's a grayscale image with one channel. And then how many channels coming out? Whatever you like, right? So remember, you always get to pick how many filters you create, regardless of whether it's a fully connected layer, in which case it's just the, the width of the matrix you're multiplying by, or in this case with a 2D conv, it's just how many, how many filters do you want. So I picked eight, and so after this it's stride two, so the 28 by 28 image is now a 14 by 14 feature map with eight channels, so specifically therefore it's an eight by 14 by 14 tensor of activations. Um, then we'll do batch norm, then we'll do ReLU. So the number of input filters to the next conv has to equal the number of output filters from the previous conv. Um, and we can just keep increasing the number of channels. Um, because we're doing stride two, it's going to keep decreasing the grid size. Notice here it goes from seven to four, because if you're doing a stride two conv over seven, it's going to be kind of math.ceiling of seven divided by two. Um, batch norm ReLU con, we're now down to two by two, batch norm ReLU con, we're now down to one by one. Right? So after this, we have a um, batch si uh, the, uh, a feature map of, um, let's see, 10 by one by one. Um, does that make sense? We've got a grid size of one now. So it's not um, a vector of length 10, it's a um, rank three tensor of 10 by one by one. So our loss functions expect generally a vector, not a rank three tensor. So you can chuck flatten at the end, and flatten just means remove any unit axes. So that will make it now just a vector of length 10, which is what we always expect. So that's how we can create a CNN. Um, so then we can turn that into a learner by passing in the data and the model and the loss function and if optionally some metrics. So we're going to use cross entropy as usual. So we can then call learn.summary and confirm. After that first conv, we're down to 14 by 14. And after the second conv, 7 by 7, and then 4 by 4, 2 by 2, 1 by 1. The flatten comes out calling it a lambda, um, but that, as you can see, it gets rid of the one by one, and it's now just a length 10 vector for each item in the batch. So a 128 by 10 matrix of the whole mini batch. Um, so just to confirm that 
this is working okay, we can grab that um, mini batch of X that we created um, earlier, there's our mini batch of X, um, pop it onto the GPU and call the model directly, remember any PyTorch module we can pretend it's a function uh, and uh, that gives us back, as we hoped, a 128 by 10 result. Okay, so that's how you can directly get some predictions out. LR find, fit one cycle, and bang. We already have a 98.6% accurate um, uh, ConvNet, um, and this is trained from scratch, of course, it's not pre-trained, we literally created our own architecture, it's about the simplest possible architecture you can imagine, 18 seconds to train. So that's how easy it is to create a, a pretty accurate um, digit detector. So let's refactor that a little, um, rather than saying conv batch norm ReLU all the time, um, FastAI already has something called conv underscore layer, which lets you create conv batch norm ReLU combinations. And it has various other options to do other tweaks to it, but the basic version is just exactly what I just showed you. So we can refactor that like so. So that's exactly the same neural net. <coughs> and so, you know, let's just train it a little, little bit longer and it's actually 99.1% accurate if we train it for all of a minute. So that's cool. So how can we improve this? Well, what we really want to do is create a um, deeper network. And so a very easy way to create a deeper network would be after every stride two conv, add a stride one conv because the stride one conv doesn't change the feature map size at all, so you can add as many as you like, right? But there's a problem. Um, um, there's a problem. And the problem was pointed out in this paper, very, very, very influential paper called Deep, Learning, uh, Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition uh, by uh, Kai Ming He and uh, colleagues at, then at Microsoft Research. Um, and they did something interesting. They said, let's look at the training error. So forget generalization even. Let's just look at the training error of um, a network trained on Sci-Fi 10. Um, and let's try one network with 20 layers, just basic three by three cons, just basically the same network I just showed you, um, but without batch norm. Um, uh, let's try a 20 layer one and a 56 layer one on the training set. So the 56 layer one has a lot more parameters. It's got a lot more of these stride one cons in the middle. Um, so the one with more parameters should seriously overfit, right? So you would expect the 56 layer one to zip down to zero-ish training error pretty quickly. And that is not what happens. It is worse than the shallower network. So when you see something weird happen, really good researchers don't go, oh no, it's not working. They go, that's interesting. So Kai Ming He said, that's interesting, what's going on? And he said, I don't know, but what I do know is this. I could take this 56 layer network and make a new version of it which is identical, but has to be at least as good as the 20 layer network, and here's how. Every two convolutions, I'm going to add together the input to those two convolutions, add it together with the result of those two convolutions. So in other words, he's saying, instead of saying um, uh, output equals conv2 of conv1 of x, instead he's saying output equals x plus conv2 of conv1 of x. So that 56 layers worth of convolutions in, in that, his theory was has to be at least as good as the 20 layer version because it could always just set conv2 and conv1 to a bunch of zero weights for everything except for the first 20 layers because, because the x the input could just go straight through. So this thing here is, as you see, called an identity connection. It's the identity function, nothing happens at all. Uh, it's also known as a skip connection. So that was a theory, 
right? That, that's what the paper describes as the intuition behind this, is what would happen if we created something which has to train at least as well as a 20-layer neural network because it kind of contains that 20-layer neural network. There's literally a path. You can just skip over all the convolutions. Um, and so what happens? And what happened was he won ImageNet that year. He easily won ImageNet that year. And in fact, you know, even today, you know, uh, we uh, had that... Uh, uh, record-breaking result on ImageNet speed training ourselves, you know, in the last year, we used this too. You know, ResNet has been revolutionary. Um, and any time, here's a trick, if you're interested in doing some research, some novel research, any time you find uh, some model for anything, whether it's like medical image segmentation or, you know, some kind of GAN or whatever, um, you know, and it was written couple of years ago, they might have forgotten to put ResNets in, ResBlock, ResBlocks. I, 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 this is what we normally call a, a ResBlock. They might have forgotten to put ResBlocks in. So replace their convolutional path with a bunch of ResBlocks, and you'll almost always get better results faster. It's a good trick. So at NeurIPS, which uh, Rachel and I and David all just came back from, um, and Sylvain, um, uh, we saw a... Um, new presentation where they actually figured out how to visualize the loss surface of a neural net, uh, which is really cool. Uh, this is a fantastic paper. And anybody who's watching this, Lesson 7, is at a point where they will understand most of the most important concepts in this paper. You could read this now. You won't necessarily get all of it, but I'm sure you'll find it, get enough to find it interesting. And so the, the, the big picture was this one. Here's what happens if you, if you draw a picture where kind of X and Y here are two projections of the, of the weight space, and Z is the loss. And so as you move through the weight space, um, a, a, a 56-layer neural network without skip connections is very, very bumpy. And that's why this got nowhere, because it just got stuck in all these hills and valleys. The exact same network with identity connections, with skip connections, has this lost landscape, right? So that's, it's, it's kind of interesting how, how, um, how her recognized back in 2015, you know, this shouldn't happen, here's a way that must fix it, and it took three years before people were able to say, oh, this is kind of why it fixed it. It kind of reminds me of the batch norm discussion we had a couple of weeks ago, um, of people realizing a little bit after the fact sometimes what's, what's going on and why it helps. So, um, in our code, we can create a res block in just the way I described. We create a, an nn.module, we create two conv layers. Remember, a conv layer is conv2d batch norm ReLU. Um, Sorry, conv2d, ReLU, batch norm. Um, so I create two of those, and then in forward, we go conv1 of x, conv2 of that, and then add x. Um, there's a resBlock function already in FastAI, so you can just call resBlock instead, and you just um, pass in something saying how many filters do you want. So, yeah, so there's the resBlock that I defined in our notebook. Um, and so with that, no, with that res block, we can now um, take every one of those, I've just copied the previous CNN, and after every conv2, except the last one, I added a res block. So this has got now got three times as many layers. So it should be able to do more compute, right? But it shouldn't be any harder to optimize. So what happens? Um, well, let's just refactor it one more time. Since I go conv2 res block so many times, let's just pop that into a little mini sequential model here. And so I can refactor that like so. Like keep refactoring your architectures if you're trying novel architectures because you'll make less mistakes. Um, very few people do this. Most research code you look at is, is clunky as all hell um, and people often make mistakes in that way. So don't, don't do that. Be, you know, you're all coders. So use your coding skills to make life easier. Okay, so there's my 
ResNet-ish architecture. And LRFind, as usual, fit for a while. And I get 99.54. So that's interesting because we've trained this literally from scratch with an architecture we built from scratch. I didn't look up this architecture anywhere. It was just the first thing that came to mind. Um, but in terms of where that puts us, 0.45% uh, error is around about the state of the art for this data set as of three or four years ago. Now, you know, today MNIST is considered a kind of trivially easy data set. Um, so I'm not saying like, wow, we've broken some records here. People have got beyond 0.45% error. But what I'm saying is that, you know, we can't, you know, uh, 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 this kind of ResNet is a genuinely extremely useful network still today. And this is, this is really all we use in our fast image net training still. And one of the reasons as well is that it's so popular, so the, the vendors of the library spend a lot of time optimizing it, uh, so things tend to work fast. Um, whereas some more modern style architectures using things like separable or grouped convolutions tend not to actually train very quickly in practice. Um, if you look at the definition of res block in the fast AI code, you'll see it looks a little bit different to this. And that's because I've created something called a merge layer. And a merge layer is something which in the forward, uh, just skip dense for a moment, the forward says x plus x dot orig. Um, so you can see there's some, something ResNet-ish going on here. What is x dot orig? Well, if you create a special kind of sequential model called a sequential EX, so this is like the fast AI's sequential extended. It's just like a normal sequential model, but we store the input in x dot orig, right? And so um, this, this here, sequential ex conv layer, conv layer, merge layer, will do exactly the same as this, okay? So you can create your own variations of ResNet blocks very easily with just sequential ex and merge layer. Um, so there's something else here, which is when you create your merge layer, you can optionally set dense equals true. What happens if you do? Well, if you do, it doesn't go x plus x dot ridge. It goes cat x comma x dot ridge. In other words, rather than putting a plus in this connection, it does a concatenate. So that's pretty interesting because what happens is that you have your, um, your input coming into your res block. And once you use concatenate instead of plus, it's not called a res block anymore, it's called a dense block. And it's not called a res net anymore, it's called a dense net. So the dense net was invented about a year after the res net. And if you read the dense net paper, it can sound incredibly complex and different, but actually it's literally identical, but plus here is replaced with, with cat. So you have your input coming into your dense block, right? And you've got a kind of few convolutions in here, and then you've got some output coming out, and then you've got your identity connection. And remember, it doesn't plus, it concats. So if this is the channel axis, it gets a little bit bigger, right? And then so we do another dense block, right? And at the end of that, we have, um, you know, all of this coming in. Um, oh, sorry, we have Okay, so at the end of that, we have, you know, the result of the convolution as per usual, but this time, the identity block is that big, right? So you can see that what happens is that with dense blocks, you're, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And kind of interestingly, the exact input is still here, right? So it actually, no matter how deep you get, the original input pixels are still there, and the original layer one features are still there, and the original layer two features are still there. So, as you can imagine, um, dense nets are very memory intensive. Um, there are ways to manage this, just from time to time, you can have a regular convolution that squishes your channels back down, but they are memory intensive. Um, but, they have very few parameters. So, for um, dealing with small data sets, you should definitely experiment with uh, dense blocks and dense nets. Um, uh, they tend to work really well on small data sets. 
Also, because it's possible to kind of keep those original input pixels all the way down the path, they work really well for segmentation, right? Because for segmentation, you know, you kind of want to be able to reconstruct the original resolution of your picture. So having all of those original pixels still there is, is super helpful. So, um, so that's, uh, that's ResNets, and the main, one of the main reasons, other than the fact that ResNets are awesome, to tell you about them is that these skip connections are useful in other places as well. Um, and they're particularly useful in other places and other ways of designing architectures for segmentation. So in building this lesson, um, I, I always kind of, I keep trying to take old papers and saying, like, imagining, like, what would that person have done if they had access to all the modern techniques we have now? And I try to kind of rebuild them in a more modern style. So I've been really rebuilding um, this next architecture we're going to look at called a unit um, in a more modern style um, recently. And I uh, got to the point now, I keep showing you this uh, um, semantic segmentation um, uh, paper with the state of the art for Canvid, which was 91.5. Um, this week I got it up to 94.1 using the architecture I'm about to show you. So we just, we keep pushing this further and further and further. Um, and it's really was all about, um, you know, a adding all of the modern tricks. Um, many of which I'll show you today, uh, some of which we'll see in part two. So, um, what we're going to do to get there is we're going to use this unit. So we've used a unit before. Um, I've um, improved it a bit since then. So we've used a unit before. We used it when we did the Canvid segmentation, but we didn't understand what it was doing. So we're now in a position where we can understand um, what it was doing. Um, and so the first thing we need to do is kind of uh, understand the basic idea of how you can do um, segmentation. So if we go back to our Canvid notebook, um, in our Canvid notebook you'll remember that basically what we were doing is we were taking these photos and um, adding a, a, a class to every single pixel. And so when you go data.showbatch for something which is a segmentation item list, um, um, it will automatically show you these color-coded pixels. Um, so, here's the thing, like, in order to color code this as a pedestrian, you know, but this as a bicyclist, it needs to know what it is. It needs to actually know that's what a pedestrian looks like, and it needs to know that's exactly where the pedestrian is, and this is the arm of the pedestrian and not part of their shopping basket. It needs to really understand a lot about this picture to do this task, and it really does do this task. Like, when you looked at the results of our top model, it's, it's um, you know, I, I can't see a single pixel by looking at it by eye. I know there's a few wrong, but I can't see the ones that are wrong. It's that accurate. So how does it do that? So the way that we're doing it to get these um, really, really good results is, not surprisingly, um, using pre-training. So we start with a ResNet 34. And you can see that here, unit learner data comma models dot resnet 34. And if you don't say pre-trained equals false, by default you get pre-trained equals true, because why not? Um, so we start with a, 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 a resnet um, 34, which starts with a, a big image. So in this case, this is from the unit paper. Now, their images, they started with um, one channel by 572 by 572. This is for medical imaging segmentation. Um, so after your stride 2 conv, you, um, they're doubling the number of channels to 128, and they're halving the size, so they're now down to 280 by 280. Um, in this original unit paper, they didn't add any padding, so they lost a pixel on each side each time they did a conv. That's why you're losing these two. Um, but so basically half the size, and then half the size, and then half the size, and then half the size, until they're down to 28 by 28 with 1,024 channels, right? So that's, that's what the unit's downsampling path, this is called the downsampling path, look like. Ours is just a 
ResNet 34. Um, so you can see it here, learn.summary, right? This is literally a ResNet <coughs> 34. So you can see that the size keeps halving, channels keep going up, um, and so forth, okay? So eventually, you've got down to a point where if you use a unit architecture, it's 28 by 28 um, with 1,024 channels. With the ResNet architecture, it, with a 224 pixel input, it would be um, 512 channels by 7 by 7. So it's a pretty small grid size on this feature map. Somehow, we've got to end up with something which is the same size as our original picture. So how do we do that? How do you do computation which increases the grid size? Well, we don't, we don't have a way to do that in our current bag of tricks. We can use a stride one conv to do computation and keeps grid size, or a stride two conv to do computation and halve the grid size. So how do we double the grid size? We do a stride half conv, also known as a deconvolution, also known as a transposed convolution. There is a fantastic paper called A Guide to Convolution Arithmetic for Deep Learning that shows a great picture of exactly what does a three by three kernel stride half conv look like. And it's literally this. If you have a two by two input, so the blue squares are the two by two input, you add not only two pixels of padding all around the outside, but you also add a pixel of padding between every pixel. And so now if we put this three by three kernel here and then here and then here, you see how the three by three kernel is just moving across it in the usual way? You will end up going from a two by two output to a five by five output. So if you only added one pixel of padding around the outside, you would add up, end up with a three by three output. Right? So, uh, sorry, four by four. Um, so this is how you can increase the resolution. Um, this was the way people did it until maybe a year or two ago. Uh, it's another trick for improving things you find online, because this is actually a dumb way to do it. And it's kind of obvious it's a dumb way to do it for a couple of reasons. One is that, like, have a look at this. Nearly all of those pixels are white. They're, they're nearly all zeros. So, like, what a waste. What a waste of time. What a waste of computation. There's just nothing going on there. Um, also, this one, uh, when you get down to, like, um, that 3x3 three three area, two out of the nine pixels are non-white. But this one... One out of the nine are non-white. So they're kind of like, there's different amounts of information going into different parts of your convolution. So like, it just doesn't make any sense um, to kind of throw away information like this and to kind of do all this unnecessary computation and have different parts of the convolution having access to different amounts of information. Um, so um, what people generally do nowadays is something really simple, which is if you have a, let's say a two by two input uh, with these are your pixel values, A, A, B, C, and D. And you want to create a 4 by 4. Why not just do this? A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 D. So I've now upscaled from 2 by 2. To four by four. I haven't done any interesting computation, but now on top of that, I could just do a stride one convolution, and now I have done some computation, right? So an up sample, this is called um, nearest neighbor interpolation, nearest neighbor interpolation. So you can just do, and that's super fast, which is nice. So you can do a nearest neighbor interpolation, and then a stride one conv, and now you've got some computation, which is actually kind of using, you know, there's no zeros here. This is kind of nice because it gets a mixture of A's and B's, which is kind of what you would want, and so forth. Um, another approach is instead of using nearest neighbor interpolation, you can use bilinear interpolation. 
which basically means instead of copying A to all of those different cells, you take a kind of a weighted average of the cells around it. So for example, if you were um, you know, looking at what should go here, you would kind of go like, oh, it's about three A's, two C's, one D, and two B's, and you kind of take the average. Not exactly, but roughly, just a weighted average. Bilinear interpolation you'll find in any, you know, all over the place, it's a pretty standard technique. Um, Any time you look at a picture on your computer screen and change its size, it's doing bilinear interpolation. So you can do that, and then a stride one conv. Um, so that was what people were using, well, that's what people still tend to use. Um, that's as much as I'm gonna teach you um, this part. In part two, we'll actually learn what the fast AI library is actually doing uh, behind the scenes, which is something called uh, pixel shuffle, uh, also known as sub-pixel convolutions. It's got not dramatically more complex, but complex enough that I won't cover it today. There's the same basic idea. All of these things is something which is basically letting us do a convolution that ends up with something that's twice the size. And so that gives us our upsampling path, right? So that lets us go from 28 by 28 to 54 by 54 and keep on doubling the size. So that's good. Um, and that was, that was it until UNET came along. That's what people did. And it didn't work real well, which is not surprising because like in this 28 by 28 feature map, how the hell is it gonna have enough information to reconstruct a 572 by 572 output space. You know, that's a really tough ask. So you tended to end up with these things that lacked fine detail. Um, so, um, what um, Olaf Rodeberger and uh, et al. did um, was they said, hey, let's add a skip connection, an identity connection. And amazingly enough, this was before ResNets existed. So this was like a really big leap, really impressive. And so, but rather than adding a skip connection that skipped every two convolutions, they added skip connections where these gray lines are. In other words, they added a skip connection from the same part of the downsampling path to the same sized bit in the upsampling path. And they didn't add, that's why you can see the white and the blue next to each other, they didn't add, they concatenated. So basically these are like dense blocks, right? But the skip connections are skipping over larger and larger amounts of the architecture. Um, so that over here, you've literally got, well nearly, the input pixels themselves coming into the computation of these last couple of layers. And so that's gonna make it super handy for resolving the fine details in these segmentation tasks because you've like literally got all of the fine details. On the downside, you don't have very many layers of computation going on here, just four, right? So you better hope that by that stage you've done all the computation necessary to figure out is this a bicyclist or is this a pedestrian? But you can then add on top of that something saying like is this you know, is this exact pixel where their nose finishes or is that the start of, of the tree? So that works out really well. Um, and that's a UNET. So this is the UNET code from FastAI. And the key thing that comes in is the encoder. The encoder refers to that part. In other words, in our case, a ResNet 34. Um, in most cases, they have this specific older style architecture. But like I said, replace any older style architecture bits with ResNet bits and life improves, particularly if they're pre-trained. So that certainly happened for us. So we start with our encoder. So our layers of our UNet is an encoder, then batch norm, then ReLU, and then middle conv, which is just conv layer, comma, conv layer. Remember, conv layer is a, a conv ReLU batch norm in FastAI. And so the middle conv is these two extra steps here at the bottom. Okay, just doing a little bit of computation. Little, you know, you, it's kind of nice to add more layers of computation where you can. So encoder, batch norm, ReLU, and then two convolutions. And then we enumerate through um, 
these indexes. What are these indexes? I haven't included the code, but these are basically, we figure out what is the layer number where each of these stride 2 comms occurs, and we just store it in an array of indexes. So then you, we can loop through that, and we can basically say for each one of those points, create a unit block, telling us how many upsampling channels there are and how many cross connection. These, um, these things here are called cross connections, or at least that's what I call them. Um, so um, that's really the main works going on in the, in the unit block. Um, as I said, there's quite a few tweaks we do, as well as the fact we use a much better encoder. We also use some tweaks in all of our app sampling using this pixel shuffle. We use another tweak called ICNR. Um, and then another tweak, which I just did in the last week, is to not just take the result of the convolutions and pass it across, but we actually grab the input pixels and make them another cross connection. That's what this last cross is here. You can see we're literally appending a res block with the original um, inputs. So you can see our merge layer. Um, so really all the work's going on in unit block. And unit block is, um, it has to store the, the uh, activations at each of these downsampling points. And um, the way to do that, as we learned in the last lesson, is with hooks. So we, we put hooks into the ResNet 34 to store the activations each time there's a um, stride 2 conv. And so that's, you can see here, we, we grab the hook. Okay. And um, we grab the result of the, the, the stored value in that hook, and we literally just go torch.cat, so we concatenate um, um, the uh, upsampled uh, um, convolution with the result of the hook, which we chuck through batch norm, and then we do two convolutions to it. And actually, you know, something you could play with at home is pretty obvious here. Anytime you see two convolutions like this, there's an obvious question is, what if we used a ResNet block instead? So you could try replacing those two comms with a ResNet block. You might find you get even better results. Now, they're the kind of things I look for when I look at an architecture is like, oh, two comms in a row, probably should be a ResNet block. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's UNET. Um, and, you know, it's amazing to think, you know, it preceded ResNet, it preceded DenseNet. Um, it's been, it, it wasn't even published in a major machine learning um, venue. It was actually published in MICI, which is a specialized medical image computing conference. Um, for years, actually, you know, it was largely unknown outside of the medical imaging community. And actually what happened was, um, Kaggle competitions for segmentation kept on being um, easily won by people using UNETs. And that was the first time I saw it getting noticed outside the medical imaging community. And then gradually a few people in the academic machine learning community started noticing and now everybody loves UNET, which I'm glad because it's just, it's just awesome. Um, so yeah, so uh, identity connections, regardless of whether they're a plus style or a concat style are incredibly useful. Um, they can basically get us close to the state of the art on lots of important tasks. Um, so I want to use them on um, another task now. And so the next task I want to look at is um, image restoration. So image restoration refers to um, starting with an image. And this time we're not going to create a segmentation mask, but we're going to try and create a, a better image. And there's lots of kind of versions of better, there could be different image. So the kind of things we can do with this kind of image generation would be take a low res image, make it high res, take a black and white image, make it color, take an image where something's been cut out of it and try and replace the cut out thing, uh, take a photo and try and turn it into what looks like a line drawing, take a photo and try and make it look like a Monet painting. These are all examples of kind of image to image generation tasks which you'll know how to do um, after this part of the class. So in our case, we're going to um, try to do image restoration, which is going to start with low resolution, poor quality JPEGs with writing written over the top of them and get them to replace them with high resolution, good quality pictures in which the, the, the text has been removed. 
two questions? Okay, let's go. Why do you concat before calling conf2, conf1, not after? Um, because if you did conf1, con, you know, if you did your conf before you concat, then there's no way for the channels of the two parts to interact with each other. You don't get any, you know, so remember in a 2D conf, it's really 3D, right? It's moving across two dimensions, but in each case, it's doing a dot product of all three dimensions of a rank three tensor, row by column by channel. So generally speaking, we want as much interaction as possible. We want to say, um, you know, this part of the downsampling path and this part of the upsampling path, if you look at the combination of them, you find these interesting things. So generally, um, you know, you, you want to have as many interactions going on as possible in each computation that you do. How does concatenating every layer together in a dense net work when the size of the image feature maps is changing through the layers? Uh, that's a great question. So if you have a stride two conv, you can't keep dense netting, right? So um, that's what actually happens in a dense net is you kind of go like dense block growing, dense block growing, dense block growing, so you're getting more and more channels. And then you do a stride two conv without a dense block. And so now it's kind of gone. And then you just do a few more dense blocks and then it's gone. So in, in practice, a dense block doesn't actually keep all the information all the way through, but it just every, up until every one of these um, stride two conves. Um, and there's kind of various ways of doing these bottlenecking layers where you're basically um, saying, hey, let's, let's reset. Um, it also helps us keep memory under control because at that point we can decide how many channels we actually want. Good questions, thank you. Right, so um, uh, in order to create something which can turn um, crappy images into nice images, um, we need a data set containing um, nice versions of images and crappy versions of the same images. So the easiest way to do that is to start with the nice images and crapify them. And so the way to crapify them is to create a function called crapify, which contains your crapification logic. So um, my crapification logic, you can pick your own, uh, is that I open up my nice image, I resize it to be really small, 96 by 96 pixels, um, with bilinear interpolation. Uh, I then pick a random number between 10 and 70. Uh, I draw that number into my image at some random location. Uh, and then I save that image with a JPEG quality of that random number. And a JPEG quality of 10 is like absolute rubbish. Uh, a jQuery quality of 70 is not bad at all, okay? So I end up with uh, high quality images, low quality images that look uh, something like these. And so you can see this one, you know, there's the image, and this is after transformation, so that's why it's been flipped. And you won't always see the image because we're um, zooming into them, so a lot of the time the image is cropped out. Um, so yeah, it's trying to figure out how to take this incredibly JPEG artifacty thing with, with text written over the top and turn it into, into this. So I'm using the um, Oxford Pets data set again, the same one we used in lesson one. Um, so there's nothing more high quality than pictures of dogs and cats. I think we can all agree with that. Um, uh, the crapification process can take a while, but uh, FastAI has a function called parallel. And if you pass parallel a function name and a list of things to run that function on, it will run that function on them all in parallel. Um, so this actually can run pretty quickly. Um, the way you write this function is where you get to do all the interesting stuff in this assignment. Try and think of an interesting crapification which does something that you want to do, right? So if you want to, you know, colorize black and white images, you would replace it with black and white. If you want something which can, you know, take like large cutout blocks of image and replace them with kind of hallucinated image, you know, add a big black box to these. 
Um, if you want something which can kind of take old family photo scans that have been like folded up and have crinkles in, try and find a way of like adding dust prints and crinkles and so forth, right? And anything that you don't include in Crapify, your model won't learn to fix because every time it sees that in your photos, the input and output will be the same. So it won't consider that to be something worthy of fixing. Okay, so, um, so we now want to create a model which can take an input uh, photo that looks like that and output something that looks like that. Um, so obviously what we want to do is use a unit because we already know that units can do exactly that kind of thing and we just need to pass the unit um, uh, that data, okay? So our data is just literally the file names of each of those, from each of those two folders. Um, do some transforms, data bunch, normalize. Um, we'll use ImageNet stats because we're going to use a pre-trained model. Why are we using a pre-trained model? Well, because like if you're going to get rid of this 46, you need to know what probably was there. And to know what probably was there, you need to know what this is a picture of, right? Because otherwise, how can you possibly know what it ought to look like? So, you know, let's use a pre-trained model that knows about these kinds of things. So we create our unit with that data. Uh, the architecture is ResNet 34. Um, these three things are important and interesting and useful, but I'm going to leave them to part two. Okay, for now, you should always include them when you use a, a unit for this kind of um, problem. Um, and so now we're going to, um, and this whole thing I'm calling a generator. Okay, it's going to generate. This is generative modeling. We're kind of, I'm not, it's, there's not a really formal definition, but it's basically something where the thing we're outputting is like a real object, in this case, an, an image. It's not just a number. Um, so we're going to create a, uh, a generator learner, uh, which is this unit learner, uh, and then we can fit. We're using MSC loss, right? So in other words, what's the mean squared error between the actual pixel value that it should be and the pixel value that we predicted? Um, MSC loss normally expects um, two vectors. Um, in our case, we have two images. So we have a version called MSC loss flat, which simply flattens out those images into a big long vector. Um, there's, there's never any reason not to use this. Even if you do have a vector, it works fine. If you don't have a vector, it'll also work fine. So we're already, you know, down to 0.05 um, mean squared error on the pixel values, which is not bad after 1 minute 35. Um, like all things in fast AI pretty much, because we're doing transfer learning by default, when you create this, it'll freeze the, um, uh, the pre-trained part. And the pre-trained part of a unit is this part, the downsampling part. That's where the ResNet is. So let's unfreeze that and train a little more. And look at that. So with, uh, you know, three minutes of, four minutes of training, we've got something which is basically doing a perfect job of removing numbers. <clears throat> it's certainly not doing a good job of upsampling, um, but it's definitely doing a nice, you know, sometimes when it removes a number, it maybe leaves a little bit of JPEG artifact, but um, it's certainly doing something pretty useful. And so if all we wanted to do was um, um, kind of watermark removal, we'd be finished. Um, we're not finished. Um, because we actually want this thing to look more like this thing. Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, the problem, the reason that we're not making as much progress with that as we'd like is that our loss function doesn't really describe what we want because actually the, the mean squared error between the pixels of this and this is actually very small, right? And if you actually think about it, most of the pixels are very nearly the right color but we're missing the texture of the pillow, and we're missing the eyeballs entirely, pretty much, right? And we're missing the texture of the fur, right? So we want, we want some loss function <clears throat> that does a better job than pixel mean squared error loss of saying, like, is this a good quality picture of this thing? So there's a fairly general way of answering that question. And it's something called a um, generative adversarial network, or GAN. And um, a GAN 
tries to solve this problem by using a loss function which actually calls another model. And let me describe it to you. So we've got our crappy image, right? And we've already created a generator. It's not a great one, but it's not terrible, right? And that's creating predictions, um, like, like this. Um, we have a high-res image, like that, and we can compare the high-res image to the prediction with, <coughs> with pixel MSE. Okay. We could also train another model, which we would variably call, variously call either the discriminator or the critic, they both mean the same thing, um, I'll call it a critic. We could try and build a binary classification model that takes all the pairs of the generated image and the real high-res image and tries to classify, learn to classify, which is which. You know, so look at some picture and say like, hey, what do you think? Is that a high-res cat or is that a generated cat? How about this one? Is that a high-res cat or a generated cat? So just a regular standard binary cross-entropy classifier. So we know how to do that already. So if we had one of those, we could now train, we could fine-tune the generator, and rather than using pixel MSE as the loss, the loss could be how good are we at fooling the critic? So can we create generated images that the critic thinks are real? So that would be a very good plan, right? Because if it can do that, if, it could, if the loss function is am I fooling the critic, right, then it's going to learn to create images which the critic can't tell whether they're real or fake. So we could do that for a while, train a few batches, um, but the critic isn't that great. The reason the critic is that isn't that great is because it wasn't that hard. Like these images are really shitty, so it's really easy to tell the difference, right? So after we train the generator a little bit more using the critic as the loss function, um, the generator is going to get really good at fooling the critic. So now we're going to stop training the generator and we'll drain the critic some more on these newly generated images. So now that the generator is better, it's now a tougher task for the critic to decide which is real and which is fake. So we'll, gen so we'll train that a little bit more. And then once we've done that and the critic's now pretty good at recognizing the difference between the better generated images and the originals, We'll, call, we'll go back and we'll fine tune the generator some more using the better discriminator, the better critic as the loss function. And so we'll just go ping pong, ping pong, backwards and forwards. That's again. Um, well, that's our version of again. Um, I don't know if anybody's written this before. Um, we've, we've created a new version of again, which is kind of a lot like the original GANs, but we have this, this neat trick where we pre-train the generator and we pre-train the critic. Um, I mean, GANs have been kind of in the news a lot. They're a pretty fashionable tool, and if you've seen them, you may have heard that they're a real pain to train. Um, but it turns out, we realized that really most of the pain of training them was at the start. If you don't have a pre-trained generator and you don't have a pre-trained critic, then it's basically the blind leading the blind, right? You're basically like the critics, well, the generator's trying to generate something which fools the critic, but the critic doesn't know anything at all, so it's basically got nothing to do. And then the critic's kind of trying to decide whether the generated images are real or not, and like that's really obvious, so that just does it. And so they kind of like don't go anywhere for ages, and then once they finally start picking up steam, they go along pretty quickly. So if you can find a way to generate things without using a GAN, like mean squared error pixel loss, and discriminate things without using a GAN, like predict on that first generator, you can make a lot of progress. So let's create the um, critic. So to create just a totally standard fast AI binary classification model, we need two folders. One folder is containing high res images, one folder containing generated images. We already have the folder with the high res images, so we just have to save our generated images. So here's a teeny tiny bit of code that does that. Um, we're going to create a directory called imagegen, pop it into a variable called pathgen. 
Um, we've got a little function called save preds that takes a data loader and we're going to grab all of the file names because remember that in an item list the dot items contains the file names if it's an image item list. So here's the file, file names in that um, data loader's data set. And so now let's go through each batch of the data loader and let's grab a batch of predictions for that batch. Right? And then reconstruct equals true means it's actually going to create fast AI image objects for each of those, um, each thing in the, in the batch. And so then we'll go through each of those predictions and save them. And the name we'll save it with is the name of the original file, but we're going to pop it into our new directory. So that's it. That's how you save predictions. And so you can see I'm kind of increasingly not just using stuff that's already in the FastAI library, but trying to show you how to write stuff yourself, right? Um, and generally it doesn't require heaps of code to do that. And so if you come back for part two, this is what, you know, part, lots of part two were kind of like, here's how you use things inside the library, and of course, here's how we wrote the library. So we're increasingly writing our own code. Okay, so save those predictions, and then let's just do a pil.image.open on the first one, and yep, there it is. Okay, so there's an example of a generated image. So now I can train a critic in the usual way. Um, it's really annoying to have to restart Jupyter Notebook to refresh your reclaim GPU memory. So one easy way to handle this is if you just set something that you knew was using a lot of GPU to none, like this learner, and then just go gc.collect, that tells Python to do uh, memory garbage collection, and uh, after that, <coughs> you'll generally be fine. Uh, you'll be able to use all of your GPU memory again. Um, if you're using NVIDIA SMI to actually look at your GPU memory, you won't see it clear, because uh, PyTorch still has a kind of allocated cache, but it, it makes it available. Um, so you should find this is how you can avoid restarting your notebook. Okay, so we're going to create our critic. It's just an image item list from folder in the totally usual way. Um, and the classes will be the um, image gen and images. Uh, we'll do a random split because we want to know how well we're doing with the critic to have a validation set. We just label it from folder in the usual way. Add some transforms, data bunch, normalize. So it's a totally standard object classifier. Um, Okay, so we've got a totally standard uh, classifier. Um, so here's what some of it looks like. So here's one from the real images, real images, generated images, generated images. Okay, so that's, it's got to try and figure out which class is which. Um, okay, so we're going to use binary cross entropy as usual. Um, <coughs> however, we're not going to use a ResNet here. And the reason we'll get into in more detail in part two, but basically when you're doing a GAN, you need to be particularly careful that the, um, the generator and the critic can't kind of both push in the same direction and like increase the weights out of control. Um, so we have to use something called spectral normalization to make GANs work nowadays. We'll learn about that in part two. So, if, but anyway, if you say GAN critic, that will give you, FastAI will give you a, a binary classifier suitable for GANs. I strongly suspect we probably can use a ResNet here. We just have to create a pre-trained ResNet with spectral norm. Hope to do that pretty soon. Um, we'll see how we go. But as of now, this is kind of the best approach. There's this thing called GAN critic. Um, a, a GAN critic, um, uses a slightly different way of, of averaging um, the, the different parts of the image when it does the loss. So anytime you're doing a GAN at the moment, you have to wrap your loss function with adaptive loss. Again, we'll look at the details in part two. For now, just know this is what you have to do and it'll work. Um, so other than that slightly odd loss function and that slightly odd architecture, everything else is the same. We can call that to create our critic. Um, because we have this slightly different architecture and slightly different loss function, we did a slightly different metric. Um, this is the equivalent GAN version of accuracy for critics. And then we can train it. 
and you can see it's 98% accurate um, at recognizing that kind of crappy thing from that kind of nice thing. And of course, we don't see the numbers here anymore, right? Because these are the generated images. The generator already knows how to get rid of those numbers that are written on top. Okay, so um, let's finish up this GAN. Um, now that we have pre-trained the generator and pre-trained the critic, we now need to get it to kind of ping pong between training a little bit of each. And um, the amount of time you spend on each of those things and the learning rates you use is still a little bit on the fussy side. So we've created a, um, um, a GAN learner for you, which you just pass in your generator and your critic, which we've just, just simply loaded here from the ones we just trained. Um, and it will go ahead and when you go learn.fit, it will do that for you. It will figure out how much time to train the generator and then when to switch to training the discriminator, the critic, and it'll go back on and forward. Um, these weights here is that um, what we actually do is we don't only use the critic as the loss function. If we only use the critic as the loss function, um, the GAN could get very good at creating pictures that um, look like real pictures, but they actually have nothing to do with the original picture, uh, the original photo at all. So we actually add together the pixel loss and the critic loss. And so, um, those two losses are kind of on different scales. So we multiply the pixel loss by something between about 50 and about 200. Again, something in that range generally works pretty well. Um, something else with GANs. Um, GANs hate momentum when you're training them. It kind of doesn't make sense to train them with momentum because you keep switching between generator and critic, so it's kind of tough. Maybe there are ways to use momentum, but I'm not sure anybody's figured it out. So. Um, this number here, when you create an atom optimizer, is where the momentum goes. So you should set that to zero. So anyway, if you're doing GANs, use these hyperparameters. Um, it should work. Um, okay. So, um, so that's what GAN Learner does. And so then you can go fit, and it trains for a while. And one of the tough things about GANs is that these loss numbers um, they're meaningless. You can't expect them to go down, right? Because as the generator gets better, it gets harder for the discriminator, the, cr the critic. And then as the critic gets better, it gets harder for the generator. So the numbers should stay about the same, right? Um, so that's one of the tough things about training GANs is it's kind of hard to know how are they doing. So the only way to know how are they doing is to actually take a look at the results from time to time. I haven't, um, and so if you put um, show image equals true here, it'll actually print out a sample after every epoch. I haven't put that in the notebook because it makes it too big for, for the repo, but you can try that. Um, so I've just put the results at the bottom, and here it is. So pretty beautiful, I would say. Um, uh, we already knew how to get rid of the the numbers, but we now don't really have that kind of artifact of where it used to be, and it's it's definitely sharpening up this little kitty cat quite nicely. Um, it's not great always. Like there's some weird kind of noise going on here. Um, uh, certainly a lot better than the horrible original. Like this is a tough job to turn that into that. Um, but there are some really obvious problems. Like here, these things ought to be eyeballs, and they're not. So why aren't they? Well, our critic doesn't know anything about eyeballs. And even if it did, it wouldn't know that eyeballs are particularly important. You know, we care about eyes. Like when we see a cat without eyes, it's a lot less cute. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm more of a dog person, but you know, um, it, it's, um, it just doesn't know that this is a feature that, that matters. Um, particularly because the critic, remember, is not a pre-trained network. So I kind of suspect that if we replace the critic with a pre-trained network that's been pre-trained on ImageNet but is also compatible with GANs, it might do a better job here. Um, but it, it's definitely a shortcoming.
of this approach. So we're going to have a break. Um, oh, question first, uh, and then we'll have a break, and then after the break, I will show you how to find the cat's eyeballs again. For what kind of problems do you not want to use UNETs? <clears throat> well, un UNETs are for when the, um, the size of your output, you know, is, is uh, similar to the size of your input and kind of aligned with it. There's no point kind of having cross connections if that level of spatial resolution in the output isn't necessary or useful. So, um, yeah, any kind of generative modeling and, you know, segmentation is kind of generative modeling, right? It's, it's generating a picture which is a mask of the original objects. Um, yeah, so probably anything where you want that kind of, that kind of resolution of the output to be of the same kind of fidelity as the resolution of the input. Um, obviously, something like a classifier makes no sense, right? You, you, in a classifier, you just want the downsampling path because at the end, you just want a single number, which is like, is it a dog or a cat? Or what kind of pet is it? Or whatever. Um, great. Okay, so let's um, get back together at five past eight. Just before we leave GANs, I'll just mention there's another um, notebook you might be interested in looking at, um, which is uh, Lesson 7 W GAN. Um, when GANs started a few years ago, people generally used them to kind of create images out of thin air, which I personally don't think is a particularly useful or interesting thing to do. Um, but it's kind of a good, I don't know, it's a good research exercise, I guess. So um, we implemented this, uh, this WGAN paper, which was kind of really the first one to do a somewhat adequate job somewhat easily. Um, and so you can see how to do that with the fast AI library. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because um, the, the data set we use is this uh, L Sun Bedrooms data set, which we've provided in our URLs, um, which just, as you can see, has bedrooms. Lots and lots and lots of bedrooms. Um, and the approach, you'll see in the pros here that Sylvain wrote, the, the, the approach that we use in this case is to just say, can we create a bedroom? And so what we actually do is that the, um, the input to the generator isn't an image that we clean up. We actually feed to the generator random noise. And so then the generator's task is, can you turn random noise into something which the critic can't tell the difference between that output and a real bedroom? Um, and so we're not doing any pre-training here or any of the stuff that makes this kind of fast and easy. Um, um, uh, so this is a very traditional approach, but you can still see, you still just go, you know, GAN learner, and there's actually a WGAN version, which is, you know, this kind of older style approach. Um, but you just pass in the data and the generator and the critic in the usual way, um, and you call fit. And you'll see, um, in this case, we have a show image on. You know, after Epoch 1, it's not creating great bedrooms or two or three. And you can really see that in the early days of these kinds of GANs, it doesn't do a great job of anything. Um, but eventually, uh, after, you know, a couple of hours of training, um, producing somewhat like bedroom-ish things, you know. So anyway, it's a notebook you can have a play with and um, um, it's a bit of fun. So um, I was very excited when we got Fast AI to the point in the last week or so um, that we had GANs working in a way where kind of API-wise they're far more concise and more flexible than any other library that exists. Um, but also kind of disappointed with them. They take a long time to train and the outputs are still like so-so. And so the next step was like, well, can we get rid of GANs entirely? So the first step with, with that, I mean, obviously the thing we really want to do is come up with a better loss function. We want a loss function that does a good job of saying this is a high quality image um, without having to go all the all the GAN trouble, and preferably it also doesn't just say it's a high quality image, but it's an image which actually looks like the thing it's meant to. 
So the real trick here um, comes back to this uh, paper from a couple of years ago, uh, perceptual losses for real-time style transfer and super resolution. <coughs> Justin Johnson uh, et al. Um, created this thing they call perceptual losses. It's a nice paper, but I, I, I hate this term um, because there's nothing particularly perceptual about them. I would call them feature losses. So in the fast AI library, you'll see this referred to as feature losses. Um, and it shares something with GANs, which is that um, um, after we go through our generator, which they call the image transform net, and you can see it's got this kind of U-net shaped thing. They didn't actually use U-nets because at the time this came out, nobody in the machine learning world much knew about U-nets. Um, nowadays, of course, we use U-nets. Um, but anyway, something U-net-ish. Um, uh, I should mention, like, uh, in these kind of, these architectures where you have a downsampling path followed by an upsampling path, the downsampling path is very often called the encoder. Um, as you saw in our code, actually, we called that the encoder. And the upsampling path is very often called the decoder. Um, <clears throat> in generative models, you know, uh, generally, including generative text models, neural translation, stuff like that, they tend to be called the encoder and the decoder, two pieces. Anyway, so we have this, um, this, this generator, and we want a, a loss function that says, you know, uh, is the thing that it's created uh, like the thing that we want? And so the way they do that is they take the prediction. Remember, y hat is what we normally use for a prediction from a model. We take the prediction and we put it through a pre-trained image net network. So at the time that this came out, the pre-trained image network they were using was VGG. Um, people still, t it's a kind of old now, but people still tend to use it because it works fine for this process. Um, so they take the prediction and they put it through VGG, the pre-trained image net network. It doesn't matter too much which one it is. Um, and so normally the output of that would tell you, hey, is this generated thing, you know, a dog or a cat or an airplane or a, or a fire engine or whatever, right? Um, but in the process of getting to that final um, classification, it goes through lots of different layers. And in this case, they've color-coded all the layers with the same um, grid size in the feature map with the same color. So every time we switch colors, we're switching grid size. So there's a stride to conv, or in VGG's case, they still used to use um, max pooling layers, which kind of similar idea. Um, and so what we could do is say, hey, let's, let's not take the final output of the VGG model on this generated image, but let's take kind of something in the middle. <coughs> Let's take the activations of some layer in the middle. So those activations, you know, it might be a feature map of like 256 channels by 28 by 28, say. And so those kind of 28 by 28 grid cells will kind of roughly semantically say things like, hey, in this, in this part of that 28 by 28 grid, is there something that looks kind of furry? Or is there something that looks kind of shiny? Or is there something that looks kind of circular? Or is there something that kind of looks like an eyeball or whatever? So what we do is that we then take the, the target, so the, the actual Y value, and we put it through the same pre-trained VGG network, and we pull out the activations at the same layer, and then we do a mean squared error comparison. So it'll say like, okay, in the real image, grid cell 1, 1 of that 28 by 28 feature map, you know, uh, is, is furry and blue and round shaped, and in the generated image, it's furry and blue and not round shaped. So it's kind of like an okay match. So that ought to go a long way towards fixing our eyeball problem, because in this case, the feature map's gonna say, there's eyeballs here, it's sorry, here, but there isn't here. So do a better job of that, please. Make better eyeballs. So that's the idea, okay? And so that's what we call feature losses, or uh, Johnson et al called perceptual losses. So, so to do that, um, we're going to use the um, Lesson 7 Super Res notebook. Um, and uh, this time, the task uh, we're going to do is kind of the same as the um, previous task, but I wrote this notebook a little bit before the GAN notebook, um, before I came up with the idea of like putting text on it and having a random JPEG quality. So the JPEG quality is always 60, there's no text written on top, um, and it's 96 by 96. So, uh, and it's before I realized what a great word crapify is, so it's called resize. Um, 
So here's our crappy images and our original images. Um, kind of a similar task to what we had before. So um, I'm going to try and create a loss function which does this. So the first thing I do is I define a base loss function, um, which is basically like how am I going to compare the pixels and the features, um, you know, and the choices mainly are like MSE or L1. Doesn't matter too much which you choose. Um, I tend to like L1 better than MSE, actually, so I picked L1. Right? So anytime you see base loss, we mean L1 loss. Uh, you could use MSE loss as well. So let's create a VGG model, right? So just using the pre-trained model. Um, in VGG, there's an attribute called dot features, which contains the uh, convolutional part of the model. So here's the uh, convolutional part of the VGG model, because we don't need the head, because we only want the, the intermediate activations. So then we'll chuck that on the GPU. We'll put it into eval mode, because we're not training it. And we'll turn off requires grad, because we don't want to update the weights of this model. We're just using it for inference, right, for, for the loss. So then let's enumerate through all the children of that model and find all of the max pooling layers, because in, in the VGG model, that's where the um, grid size changes. And as you can see from this picture, we kind of want to grab features from every time just before the grid size changes. So we grab layer I minus one. So that's the layer before it changes. So there's our list of layer numbers just before the max pooling layers. Um, and so all of those are values, not surprisingly. Um, so those are where we want to grab some features from. Uh, and so we put that in blocks. It's just a list of IDs. So here's our feature loss class, which is going to implement this idea. So basically, we, uh, when we call the feature loss class, we're going to pass it some pre-trained model. And so that's going to be called M feet. That's the model which contains the features which we want to generate for want our feature loss on. So we can go ahead and grab all of the layers from that network that we want the losses for. That we want, sorry, that we want the uh, features for to create the losses. Um, so we're going to need to hook all of those outputs because remember that's how we grab intermediate layers in PyTorch is by hooking them. So this is going to contain our um, our hooked outputs. Uh, so now in the forward of feature loss, um, we're going to call make features passing in the target. So this is our actual Y, which is just going to call that VGG model and go through all of the stored activations and just um, grab a copy of them. And so we're going to do that both for the target, call that out feet, and for the input. So that's the um, output of a generator in feet. Uh, and so now, um, let's um, calculate the L1 loss between the pixels, because we still want the pixel loss a little bit. And then let's also go through all of those <coughs> layers features <coughs> and get the L1 loss on them. Right? So we're basically going through every one of these uh, end of each block and grabbing the activations and getting the L1 on each one. So that's going to end up um, in this list called feature losses, which I then sum them all up. Okay? And you know, by the way, the reason I do it as a list is because we've got this nice little callback that um, if you put them into a thing called dot metrics in your loss function, it'll print out all of the separate layer um, loss amounts for you, which is super handy. Um, so that's it. That's our perceptual loss or feature loss um, class. And so now we can just go ahead and train a unit in the usual way with our data and our pre-trained architecture, which is a ResNet 34, passing in our loss function, which is using our pre-trained VGG model. And this is that callback I mentioned, loss metrics, which is going to print out all the different layers losses for us. Um, these are two things that we'll learn about in part two of the course, but you should use them. Uh, LR find. Uh, I just created a little function called do fit that does fit one cycle and then saves the model and then shows the results. 
So um, as per usual, because we're using a pre-trained network in our UNet, we start with frozen layers um, for the downsampling path, train for a while, and as you can see, we get not only the loss, but also the pixel loss and the loss at each of our feature layers. And then also something we'll learn about in part two called gram loss, um, which um, I don't think anybody's used for super res before as far as I know, but um, as you'll see, it turns out great. So that's uh, eight minutes, so much faster than a GAN, and already, as you can see, this is our output, modeled output, pretty good. So then we unfreeze and train some more, and it's a little bit better. And then let's switch up to double the size, and so we need to also halve the batch size to avoid running a GPU memory, and freeze again, and train some more, so it's now taking half an hour, even better. And then unfreeze and train some more. So all in all, we've done about an hour and 20 minutes of training. And look at that. It's, it's, it's done it. Like, I mean, those, it's, it knows that eyes are important. So it's really made an effort. It knows that fur is important. So it's really made an effort. So it started with something with like JPEG artifacts around the ears and um, all this mess and like eyes that are just kind of vague light blue things and it just, it really created a lot of texture. This cat is clearly kind of like looking over the top of one of those little clawing frames covered in fuzz, so it actually recognized that this thing is probably kind of a carpety material, so it's created a carpety material for us. So, I mean, that's just remarkable. So, um, talking of remarkable, we can now, um, so I, I've, n I've never seen outputs like this before without again. Uh, so I was just so excited when we were able to generate this, and so quickly, one GPU, hour and a half. Um, so like, if you create your own crapification functions and train this model, you'll build stuff that nobody's built before. Because like nobody else is, that I know of is doing it this way. So there are huge opportunities, I think. Um, so check this out. What we can now do is we can now, um, instead of starting with our low res, I actually stored another set at size 256, which are called medium res. So let's see what happens if we upsize a medium res. So we're gonna grab our medium res data, and um, <coughs> here, is, um, here is our medium res stored photo. And so can we improve this? So you can see there's still a lot of room for improvement. Like you see the, uh, the, the um, lashes here are very pixelated. Place where there should be hair here is just kind of fuzzy. So watch this area as I hit down on my keyboard. Bump. Look at that. It's done it. You know, it's taken a medium res image and it's made a totally clear thing here. You know, the furs reappeared. Like look at the eyeball. Let's go back. The eyeball here is just kind of a general blue thing. Here, it's added all the right texture, you know. So, I, I just think this is super exciting, you know. Here's a model I trained in an hour and a half um, using standard stuff that you've all learnt about, a UNet, a pre-trained model, um, a feature loss function, and we've got something which can turn that into that, uh, or, you know, this absolute mess into this. And like it's really exciting to think what, what could you do with that, right? So one of the inspirations here um, has been um, a guy called um, Jason Antich. And um, Jason um, uh, was a student in the course last year. Um, and um, what he did, very sensibly, was um, decide to focus uh, basically nearly quit his job and work four days a week, or really six days a week, on studying deep learning. And uh, as you should do, he created a kind of capstone project. And his project was to combine GANs and feature losses together. And his crapification approach was um, to take um, color pictures and make them black and white. So he took the whole of ImageNet, created a black and white ImageNet, and then trained a model to recolorize it. And he's put this up as deoldify. And now he's got these actual old photos from the 19th century that he's turning into color. And like, 
what this is doing is incredible. Like, like, look at this. The model thought, oh, that's probably some kind of copper kettle. So I'll make it like copper colored. And oh, these pictures are on the wall. They're probably like different colors to the wall. And maybe that looks a bit like a mirror. Maybe it would be reflecting stuff outside, you know. Uh, these things might be vegetables. Vegetables are often red, you know, let's make them red. Uh, it, it's, it's extraordinary what it's done. And you could totally do this too. Like you can take our feature loss and our GAN loss and combine them. So I'm very grateful to Jason because he's helped us um, build this, um, this lesson. And it's been really nice because we've been able to help him too because um, he hadn't realized that he can use all this pre-training and stuff. And so hopefully you'll see Deoldify in the next couple of weeks be even better at deoldification. Um, but hopefully you all can now add um, other kinds of decrapification um, methods um, as well. So I'm, you know, I, I, I like every course if possible to, to, to show something totally new because then every student has the chance to basically build things that have never been built before. So this is, this is kind of that thing, you know, but between the much better segmentation results and these much simpler and faster uh, decrapification results, I think you can build some really cool stuff. Did you have a question? Is it possible to use similar ideas to UNET and GANs for NLP? For example, if I want to tag the verbs and nouns in a sentence or create a really good Shakespeare generator? Yeah, um, pr pretty much. We don't fully know yet. It's a pretty new area, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. And we'll be looking at some in, in a moment, actually. Um, So I, I actually um, tried training this, uh, uh, well, I actually tried testing this on this. Um, remember this picture I showed you with a slide uh, last lesson? And it, it's a really rubbishy looking picture. And I thought, what would happen if we tried running this just through the exact same model? And it changed it from that to that. Um, so I thought that was a really good example. You can see something it didn't do, which is this weird discoloration. It didn't fix it because I didn't crapify things with weird discoloration, right? So if you want to create really good image restoration, like I say, you need really good um, um, crapification. Okay, so um, here's what we've learned so far, right, um, in, in the course, um, some of the main things. So we've learned that um, um, neural nets consist of sandwich layers of affine functions which are basically matrix multiplications, slightly more general version, and nonlinearities, like ReLU. And we learned that the results of those calculations are called activations, and the things that go into those calculations that we learn are called parameters, and that the parameters are initially randomly initialized, or we copy them over from a pre-trained model, and then we train them with SGD or faster versions, and we learned that um, convolutions are a particular affine function that work great for um, Autocorrelated data, so things like images and stuff. We learned about batch norm, dropout, data augmentation, and weight decay as ways of uh, regularizing models, and also batch norm helps train models more quickly. And then today we've learned about uh, res slash dense blocks. Um, we've obviously learned a lot about image classification and regression, embeddings, categorical and continuous variables, collaborative filtering, language models and NLP classification, and then kind of segmentation unit and GANs. So um, go over these things and make sure that you feel comfortable with each of them. If you've only watched this uh, series once, you definitely won't. People normally watch it, you know, three times or so to really understand the detail. Um, so uh, one thing that doesn't, uh, that doesn't get here is um, RNNs. So that's the last thing we're going to do, RNNs. Okay. So, um, RNNs, I'm going to introduce a little kind of diagrammatic method here to explain RNNs. Um, and the diagrammatic method, I'll start by showing you a basic neural net with a single hidden layer. Um, square means an input. So that'll be batch size by number of inputs, right? So kind of, you know, um, batch size by number of inputs. Um, an arrow means a layer, broadly defined such as matrix product followed by ReLU. A circle is um, uh, activations. 
Okay? So in this case, we have one set of hidden activations. And so given that the input was number of inputs, this here is a, a matrix of number of inputs by number of activations. So the output will be batch size by number of activations. It's really important you know how to calculate these shapes, right? So go learn.summary lots to see all the shapes. <clears throat> so then here's another arrow. So that means it's another layer, matrix product followed by nonlinearity. In this case, we're going to the output, so we use softmax. And then triangle means an output. Okay? And so this matrix product will be number of activations by number of classes. So our output is batch size by number of classes. Okay. So let's reuse the, that key. Remember, triangle output, circle is activations, um, hidden state, we also call that, um, and rectangle is input. So let's now imagine that we wanted to um, uh, create, a, get a big document, split it into um, uh, sets of three words at a time, and grab each set of three words and then try to predict um, uh, the third word using the first two words. So uh, if we had the data set in place, we could grab word one as an input, chuck it through an embedding, right, create some activations, um, pass that through a um, uh, matrix product and, um, and nonlinearity, um, grab the second word, put it through an embedding, and then we could either add those two things together or concatenate them. Generally speaking, when you see kind of two sets of activations coming together um, in a diagram, you normally have a choice of concatenate or, or add. Um, and that's going to create a second bunch of activations, and then you can put it through one more um, uh, fully connected layer and softmax to create an output. So that would be a totally standard fully connected neural net with one very minor tweak, which is concatenating or adding at this point, um, which we could use to try to predict the third word of every, uh, from pairs of two words. Okay. Um, so remember, arrows represent layer operations, um, and uh, I removed in this one the specifics of what they are because they're always an affine function followed by nonlinearity. Um, okay. Let's go further. What if we wanted to predict word four using words one and two and three? It's basically the same picture as last time, except with one extra input and one extra circle. But I want to point something out, which is each time we go from rectangle to circle, we're doing the same thing. We're doing an embedding, which is just a particular kind of matrix multiply where you have a one hot encoded input. Uh, each time we go from circle to circle, we're basically taking one piece of hidden state, one set of activations, and turning it into another set of activations by saying we're now at the next word. And then when we go from circle to triangle, we're doing something else again, which is we're saying let's convert the hidden state, these activations, into an output. So it would make sense, so you can see I've colored each of those arrows differently. So each of those arrows should probably use the same weight matrix, because it's doing the same thing. So why would you have a different set of embeddings for each word, or a different set of, uh, a different uh, matrix to multiply by to go from this hidden state to this hidden state versus this one? Okay. So um, this is what we're going to build. Uh, so we're now going to jump into human numbers, which is less than seven human numbers. And this is a data set that I created, which literally just contains all the numbers from one to 9,999 written out in English. Okay? And we're going to try and create a language model that can predict the next word in this document. It's just a toy example for this purpose. So um, in this case, we only have one document, and that one document is the list of numbers. Uh, so we can use a text list um, to create an item list with text in for the training and the validation. In this case, the validation set is the numbers from 8,000 onwards, and the training set is 1 to 8,000. Um, we can combine them together, um, turn that into a data bunch. Um, so we only have one document, so train zero is the document. Grab its dot text, that's how you grab the contents of a text list, and here are the first 80 characters. Um, uh, it starts with a special token, XXBOS. Anything starting with XX is a special fast AI token. 
BOS is the beginning of stream token. It basically says this is the start of a document. Um, it's very helpful in NLP to know when documents start so that your models can learn to recognize them. Uh, the validation set contains 13,000 tokens, so 13,000 words or punctuation marks, because everything between spaces is a separate token. Um, the uh, batch size uh, that we uh, asked for was um, 64. Um, and then by default, it uses something called BPTT of 70. BPTT, as we briefly mentioned, stands for uh, backprop through time. Um, that's the sequence length. So for each of our, um, so with each of our kind of 64 document segments, we split it up into lists of 70 words that we look at at one time. So what we do is we grab this, uh, for the validation set, entire string of 13,000 tokens, and then we split it into um, 64 roughly equal sized sections, okay? People very, very, very often think I'm saying something different. I did not say they are of length 64. They're not. They're 64 equally sized, roughly, segments. So we take the first 1 64th of the document, piece one. Second 64th, piece two, okay? Um, and then for each of those 1 64th of the document, we then split those into pieces of length 70. So each batch, right, so let's now um, say, okay, for those 13,000 tokens, how many batches are there? Well, divide by batch size and divide by 70. So there's about 2.9 batches, so three, there's gonna be three batches. So let's grab an iterator for our data loader, grab one, two, three batches, the X and the Y, um, and let's add up the number of elements and we get back slightly less than this because there's a little bit left over at the end that doesn't quite make up a full batch, okay? So this is the kind of stuff you should play around with a lot, lots of shapes and sizes and stuff and iterators. Um, as you can see, it's 95 by 64. I claimed it was gonna be 70 by 64. Um, that's because our data loader um, for language models uh, slightly randomizes uh, BPTT, just to give you a bit more kind of shuffling, get a bit more randomization, it helps the model. Um, and so here you can see the first batch of X. Yeah, remember we've numericalized all these. Um, and here's the first batch of Y. And you'll see here, this is 2, 18, 10, 11, 8. This is 18, 10, 11, 8. So this one is offset by one from here. Because that's what we want to do with a language model. We want to predict the next word. So after two should come after 18. And after 18 should come 10. Right? Um, you can grab the vocab for this data set and a vocab has a textify. So if we call exactly the same, look at the same thing but with textify, that'll just look it up in the vocab. So here you can see XXBOS 8001, whereas in the Y, there's no XXBOS, it's just 8001. So after XXBOS is eight, after eight is thousand, after thousand is one, okay? Um, and so then after we get 8023 comes X2, and look at this, we're always looking at column zero, so this is the first batch, the first mini batch comes 8,024, and then X3, all the way up to 8,040, right? And so then, we can go right back to the start, but look at batch one, right? So index one, which is batch number two, and now we can continue. A slight skip from 8,040 to 8,046, that's because the last mini batch wasn't quite complete. So what this means is that um, every mini batch, so every, um, yeah, every mini batch joins up with the previous mini batch, you know? So you can go straight from X1, zero, to X2, zero. It continues, 8,023, 8,024, right? Um, and so if you look at the same thing for colon, comma, one, you'll also see they join up. So all the mini batches join up. So that's the data, we can do show batch to see it. Um, and here is, um, our model, which is doing this, right? So um, here is, this is just the code copied over, right? 
Um, so it contain, contains one embedding, i.e. the green arrow, one hidden to hidden brown arrow layer, and one hidden to output, right? So each colored arrow has a single matrix, okay? And so then in the forward pass, we take our first input, x0, and put it through input to hidden, the green arrow, okay? To create our first set of activations, which we call h. Assuming that there is a second word, because like sometimes we might be at the end of a batch where there isn't a second word, assuming there is a second word, then we would add to h the result of x1 put through the green arrow. Remember that's i h. And then we would say, okay, our new h is the result of those two added together, put through our hidden to hidden, orange arrow, and then ReLU, then batch norm. And then for the second word, do exactly the same thing. And then finally, blue arrow, put it through HO. Right? So that's how we convert our diagram to code. So nothing new here at all. So now, let's do, okay, and, and just, you know, so we can chuck that in the learner and we can train it 46%, okay? Let's take this code and recognize it's pretty awful. Uh, there's a lot of duplicate code. And as coders, when we see duplicate code, what do we do? We refactor. So we should refactor this into a loop. So here we are. We've refactored it into a loop. So now we're going for each xi and x and doing it in a loop. Guess what? That's an RNN. An RNN is just a refactoring. It's not anything new. This is now an RNN, okay? And let's refactor our diagram from this to this. This is the same diagram, okay? But I've just replaced it with my loop. It does the same thing. Uh, so here, here it is. It's got exactly the same in it, literally exactly the same. Just popped a loop here. Um, before I start, I just have to make sure that I've got some, you know, a bunch of zeros to add to. Um, and, uh, of course, I get exactly the same result when I train it. Okay, so um, next thing that you might think then, and one nice thing about the loop, though, is now this will work even if I'm not predicting the fourth word from the previous three, but for the ninth word from the previous eight. It'll work for any arbitrarily length long sequence, which is nice. So let's up the BPTT to 20, since we can now. Um, and let's now say, okay, instead, um, um, instead of just predicting the nth word from the previous n minus 1, let's try to predict the second word from the first, and the third from the second, and the fourth from the third, and so forth, right? Because previously, like look at our loss function. Previously, we were comparing the result of our model to just the last word of the sequence. It's just very wasteful, because there's a lot of words in the sequence. So let's compare every word in X to every word in Y. So to do that, we need to change this so it's not just one triangle at the end of the loop, but the triangle is inside this, right? So that, in other words, after every loop, predict, loop, predict, loop, predict. So here's this code. It's the same as the previous code, but now I've created an array. And every time I go through the loop, I append h o h to the array. So now for n inputs, I create n outputs. So I'm predicting after every word. Previously I had 46%. Now I have 40%. Why is it worse? Well, it's worse because now, like, when I'm trying to predict the second word, I only have one word of state to use. Right? So like, and when I'm looking at the third word, I only have two words of state to use. So it's a much harder problem for it to solve. So the obvious way to fix this then would, you know, the key problem is here. I go h equals torch dot zeros. Like I reset my state to zero every time I start another BPTT sequence. Well, let's not do that. Let's keep h, right? And we can, because remember, each batch connects to the previous batch. It's not shuffled like happens in, um, you know, image classification. So let's take this exact model and replicate it again, but let's move the creation of H into the constructor. Okay, there it is. So it's now self.h. 
Okay? And so this is now exactly the same code, but at the end, let's put the new h back into self.h. Okay, so it's now doing the same thing, but it's not throwing away that state. And so therefore now, we actually get above the original. We get all the way up to 54% accuracy. So this is what a real RNN looks like. The, you know, you, you always want to keep that state, right? But just keep remembering, there's nothing different about an RNN. It's a totally normal, fully connected neural net, okay? It's just that you've got a loop you refactored. What you could do, though, is um, at the end of your uh, every loop, you could not just spit out an output, but you could spit it out into another RNN. So you could have an RNN going into an RNN. And that's nice because we've now got more layers of computation. You would expect that um, to work better. Well, to get there, let's do some more refactoring. Uh, so let's take this code and replace it with the equivalent built-in PyTorch code, which is, you just say that. So nn.rnn basically says, do the loop for me. Okay, we've still got the same embedding, we've still got the same output, we've still got the same batch norm, we've still got the same initialization of H, but we just got rid of the loop. So one of the nice things about RNN is that you can now say um, how many layers you want. So this is the same accuracy, of course. Um, so here I'm gonna do it with two layers. But here's the thing, when you think about this, right, think about it without the loop, it looks like this. Right? It's like, keeps on going, and we've got a BPTT of 20, so there's 20 layers of this. And we know from that um, Visualizing the Lost Landscapes paper that deep networks have awful, bumpy, lost surfaces. So when you start creating uh, long time scales and multiple layers, um, these things get impossible to train. Um, so there's a few tricks you can do. One thing is you can add skip connections, of course. Um, but what people normally do is instead, they um, put inside, uh, instead of just adding these together, they actually use a little mini neural net to decide how much of the green arrow to keep and how much of the orange arrow to keep. And when you do that, um, you get something that's either called a GRU or an LSTM, depending on the details of that little neural net. And we'll learn about the details of those neural nets in part two. They really don't matter, though, frankly. Um, so we can now say, let's create a GRU instead. So it's just like what we had before, um, but it'll handle longer sequences and deeper networks. Let's use two layers. Boom. And we're up to 75%. Um, okay. So um, that's RNNs. And... Um, the main reason I wanted to show it to you was to remove the, the, the last remaining piece of magic. And um, this is one of like, the least magical things we have in deep learning. It's just a, a refactored, fully connected network. Uh, so don't let RNNs ever, ever put you off. Um, and with this approach, where you basically have a sequence of N inputs and a sequence of N outputs, which we've been using for language modeling, you can use that for other tasks, right? For example, the sequence of outputs could be for every word, there could be something saying, is this something that I, is sensitive and I want to anonymize or not? You know, so like, is this private, private data or not? Or it could be a part of speech tag for that word. Um, or it could be something saying, um, you know, uh, how should that word be formatted, um, or whatever. And so these are called sequence labeling tasks, and so you can use this same approach for pretty much any sequence labeling task. Or you can do what I did in the earlier lesson, which is once you've finished building your language model, um, you can uh, throw away the kind of the, this uh, HO bit, and instead pop there a standard um, classification head, and then you can now do NLP classification, which as you saw earlier, um, will give you state-of-the-art results even on uh, long documents. So this is a super valuable technique and um, not remotely magical. Okay, so that's it, right? That's, that's deep learning, or at least, you know, the kind of the practical pieces from my point of view. Um, um, having watched this one time, um, you 
won't get it all, and, and I, I don't recommend that you do watch this so slowly that you get it all the first time, but that you go back and look at it again, take your time, and there'll be bits that you go like, oh, now I see what he's saying, and then you'll be able to like implement things you couldn't implement before, and you'll be able to dig in more than before. So like, definitely go back and do it again. And as you do, write, write code, not just for yourself, but put it on GitHub, right? It doesn't matter if you think it's great code or not. You know, the fact that you're writing code and sharing it is impressive, and the feedback you'll get if you tell people on the forum, you know, hey, I wrote this code, it's not great, but, you know, it's my first effort. Anything you see jump out at you. People will say, like, oh, that bit was done well. Hey, but did you know for this bit you could have used this library and saved you some time? You'll learn a lot by interacting with your peers. Um, as you've noticed, I've started introducing more and more papers. Now, part two will be a lot of papers, and so it's a good time to start um, reading some of the papers that have been introduced in this, in this section. Um, all the bits that say, like, derivation and theorems and lemmas, you can skip them. I do. They add almost nothing to your understanding of practical deep learning, right? But the bits that say, like, you know, um, why are we solving this problem and what are the results and so forth are, are really interesting. Um, and then, you know, try and write English prose. Um, not, not English prose that you want to be read by Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, but English prose that you want to be written, read by you as of six months ago. Because right? there's a lot more people in the audience of you as of six months ago than there is of Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun. Right? That's, that's the person you best understand. You know what they need. Right? Um, go and get help and help others. Tell us about your success stories. Um, but perhaps the most important one is get together with others. Right? People's learning works much better if you've got that um, social experience. So start a book club, get involved in meetups, create study groups, and build things. Right? And again, they, it doesn't have to be amazing. Like just build something that you think the world would be a little bit better if that existed. Or you think it would be kind of slightly delightful to your two-year-old to see that thing. Or you just want to show it to your brother the next time they come around to see what you're doing. Whatever, right? Like, just finish something, you know? Finish something. Um, and then try and make it a bit better. So, for example, uh, something I just saw this afternoon is the Elon, Ma uh, Elon Musk tweet generator. Okay. Uh, so looking at lots of uh, older tweets, creating a language model from, um, from uh, Elon Musk, and then creating new tweets, such as humanity will also have an option to publish on its own journey as an alien civilization. It will always, like all human beings, Mars is no longer possible. <gasps> AI will definitely be the central intelligence agency. Okay, so this is great. I love this. And I love that uh, Dave Smith wrote and said, um, these are my first ever commits. Thanks for teaching a finance guy how to build an app in eight weeks, right? So, you know, um, I think this is awesome. And I think, like, clearly a lot of care and passion has been put into this project. Um, you know, will it systematically change the future direction of society as a whole? Maybe not, you know, but maybe Elon will look at this and think, like, oh, you know, like, maybe I need to rethink my method of prose. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and so, yeah, create something. Put it out there. Put a bit of yourself into it. Um, or get involved in Fast AI. The Fast AI project, there's a lot going on. You know, you can help with documentation and tests, which might sound boring, but you'd be surprised how incredibly not boring it is to, like, take a piece of code that hasn't been properly documented and research it and understand it and ask Silva and I on the forum what's going on, why did you write it this way, we'll send you off to the papers that we were implementing. You know, writing a test requires deeply understanding that part of the machine learning world to really understand how it's meant to work. Um, so that's always interesting. Um, Staz Beckman has created this nice um, dev projects index, which you can like go onto the forum uh, in the fast AI dev section and find, um, actually the dev project section and find like, here's some stuff going on that you might want to get involved in. Or maybe there's stuff you want to exist, you could add your own. Um, 
create a study group. You know, Dean has already created a study group for San Francisco starting in January. This is how easy it is to create a study group, right? Go on the forum, find your little time zone subcategory, and add a post saying, let's create a study group. Okay, but make sure you, you know, give people like a little Google sheet to sign up, some way to actually do something, you know. Um, a great example is Pierre, who's been doing a fantastic job in Brazil of running um, uh, study groups for the last couple of parts of the course. And, uh, you know, he keeps posting these pictures of people having a good time and learning deep learning together, um, creating wikis together, creating projects together. Great experience. Um, and then come back for part two. Right, where we'll be um, looking at all of this interesting stuff, in particular going deep into the fast AI code base to understand how did we build it exactly. We'll actually go through, um, as we were building it, we created notebooks of like here, we, here is where we were at each stage. So we're actually going to see the software development process itself. We'll talk about the process of doing research, um, how to read academic papers, how to turn math into code, and then a whole bunch of uh, additional um, types of models that we haven't seen yet. So it'll be kind of like going beyond practical deep learning into actually um, cutting edge research. So we've got um, five minutes uh, to um, take some questions. We had an AMA going on um, online and so we're going to uh, have time for a couple of the highest ranked AMA questions from the community. And the first one is by Jeremy's request, um, although it's not the highest ranked. What's your typical day like? How do you manage your time across so many things that you do? Um, yeah, I thought that I, I, I hear that all the time, so I thought I should um, answer it, and I think I got a few votes. Because um, um, I think um, people who come to our study group uh, are always shocked at how disorganized and incompetent I am. And so I often hear people saying like, oh wow, I thought you were like this deep learning role model and I'd get to see how to be like you and now I'm not sure I want to be like you at all. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's, um, for, for me, it's all about just having a good time with it. Um, I never really have many plans. Uh, I just try to finish what I start. Um, if you're not having fun with it, it's really, really hard to continue because there's a lot of frustration in deep learning because it's not like writing a web app where it's like, you know, authentication, check. You know, uh, back-end uh, service uh, watchdog, check. Uh, okay, uh, user credentials, check. You know, like you just, you're making progress. Where else for stuff like this Dan stuff that we've been doing the last couple of weeks, it's just like, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. No, that also didn't work, oh, that also didn't work until, like, oh my God, it's amazing, it's a cat. That's kind of what it is, right? So you don't get that regular feedback. So, um, yeah, you know, you've you got to have fun with it. Um, and so, so my, yeah, my day is kind of, um, you know, I mean, the other thing I'd do, I'd say, I, I, don't, I don't do any meetings. I don't do phone calls. I don't do coffees. I don't watch TV. I don't play computer games. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family, uh, a lot of time exercising, and a lot of time reading and coding and doing things I, I like. So, um, uh, you know, I think, um, the, you know, the main thing is just finish, finish something, like properly finish it. So when you get to that point where you think you're 80% of the way through, but you haven't quite created a readme yet, and the install process is still a bit clunky, and you know, this is what 99% of GitHub projects look like. You'll see the readme says, to do, you know, complete baseline experiments, document, blah, blah, blah. It's like, don't, don't be that person, like, just do something properly and finish it and maybe get some other people around you to work with you so that you're all doing it together and, you know, get it done. What are the up-and-coming deep learning, machine learning things that you are most excited about? Also, you've mentioned last year that you are not a believer in reinforcement learning. Do you still feel the same way? Yeah, I still feel exactly the same way as I did three years ago when we started this, which is, um, it's all about transfer learning. It's underappreciated. It's under-researched. Every time we put transfer learning into anything, we make it much better. Um, you know, our, our um, academic paper on transfer learning for NLP has, you know, helped uh, be one piece of kind of changing the direction of NLP this year. It's made it all the way to the New York Times. It's just a stupid, obvious little thing that we threw together. 
Um, so I, I remain excited about that. I remain unexcited about reinforcement learning for most things. I don't see it used by normal people for normal things for nearly anything. It's an incredibly inefficient way to solve problems which are often solved more simply and more quickly in other ways. Um, it probably has a, maybe a role in the world, um, but a, a, a limited one and um, not in most people's day-to-day -day work. Uh, for someone planning to take part two in 2019, what would you recommend doing learning practicing until the part two course starts? Just code. Yeah, just code all the time. Um, I know it's perfectly possible I hear from people who get to this point of the course and they haven't actually written any code yet. And if that's you, it's okay. You know, you just go through and do it again and this time do code. Um, and, and look at the input, the shapes of your inputs and look at your outputs and make sure you know how to grab a mini batch and look at its mean and standard deviation and plot it. And, um, you know, there's, there's so much material that we've covered. Um, if you can get to a point where you can, you know, rebuild those notebooks from scratch um, without too much cheating, when I say from scratch, I mean using the FastAI library, not from scratch, from scratch, um, you know, you'll, you'll be in the top echelon of practitioners because you'll be able to do all of these things yourself and that's really, really rare. And that'll put you in a great position for part two. Should we do one more? Nine o'clock, yeah, let's do one more. Um, where do you see the FastAI li library going in the future, say in five years? Well, like I said, I don't make plans. I just, <laughs> I just piss around. So, um, I mean, our only plan for FastAI, you know, as an you know, organization, is to make deep learning accessible as a tool for normal people to use for normal stuff. Um, so as long as we need to code, we failed at that. So the big goal, you know, because 99.8% of the world can't code. Um, so the, the main goal would be to get to a point where it's not a library, but it's a piece of software that doesn't require code. And it certainly shouldn't require a goddamn lengthy, hardworking course like this one, you know. So we, I want to get rid of the course. I want to get rid of the code. <laughs> I want to make it so you can just do useful stuff uh, quickly and, and easily. So that's, that's maybe five years. Yeah, maybe longer. All right. Well, I hope to see you all back here for part two. Thank you. Thank you.